In today's video, I'm going to show you guys how to build a great value gaming PC build that you can actually assemble right now. A system that's got fantastic legs at 1080p and even 1440p gaming and comprises of components that offer up great value and that you can still buy in the current crazy memory market. More on that later. As usual, I'll be walking you guys through all the parts I've selected and why any changes that you might want to make for your own personal build, running through the build process from start to finish and looking at those gaming benchmark numbers a little bit later in everything from Fortnite, Black Ops 7 and Ark Raiders. Let's do this. The Gigabyte Aorus Master 16 is here with a 240Hz 2560 by 1600 display up to an RTX 5090 laptop GPU with a staggering 24 gigs of VRAM and Max-Q technology. The choice of CPU spans up to a Core Ultra 9 275HX2 with a turbo of up to 5.4 gigahertz and 24 cores for maximum power. What's more, there's also up to 64 gigs of RAM and room for a Gen 5 NVMe drive for the ultimate in storage speeds. Learn more at the first link in the description below. Now I've got to start this video by addressing the big thing that's happening right now and that is of course memory. Current memory prices we know are frankly ridiculous. DDR5 memory kits of a 32 gig variety are now going for literally hundreds of pounds or dollars. Stock and availability is getting worse by the day and we're in this horrendous situation that feels like the GPU shortage all over again. Everybody stay calm. What's the procedure everyone? Calm. everyone? What's the procedure? Stay now, what does that mean for those of you shopping on a bit more of a budget? For those of you who want great 1080p, a bit of 1440p, and don't want to spend a fortune? Well, I actually think it means going back a generation to DDR4 and switching out a modern Ryzen 9000 series CPU with a Ryzen 5000 chip instead. Now, you see, the thing is, this memory shortage we know is going to go on for quite some time. And when you look at CPU and GPU bottlenecks, a lot of AMD's slightly older CPUs are still more than capable when it comes to building a gaming PC with modern graphics cards. And that was why I settled today on the combination of AMD's Ryzen 5 5500 and the RX 9060 XT. Now, there's a couple of different options here. If you've got a bit more money to spend, the Ryzen 5 5600X is going to give you some slightly better performance. And if you're gaming primarily at 1080p, that might be a worthy upgrade. If you're looking to game at 1440p, where the CPU is arguably a little less important, you might want to swap out this card, the 8GB 9060 XT t with the 16 gig model instead. Now, I want to take a second to defend my choice of GPU because I can hear some of you in the comments saying, James, the 9060 XT, it's got eight gigs of VRAM. That's just not enough anymore. Now, I don't entirely disagree with that sentiment, but our testing does kind of show otherwise. Now, the 9060 XT 8 gig is gonna be very capable at 1080p. When compared to the bigger brother, the 16 gigabyte card, you do get a bit less performance, but you do so at a saving of around $70 or pounds. The other options at this price point are no better. The 8 gig 5060 has the same VRAM problem, but it's slower than the 9060 XT, so that's out of the equation. And then the only other real option would be the Intel Arc B580, a card that is cheaper than the 8 gig 9060 XT, but a card that despite having more video memory, 12 gigs to be precise, which is actually perfect for a card of this kind of caliber, is slower. It's actually slower than the 9060 XT, even with that VRAM advantage. Now, absolutely, if you can afford the 16 gig card, definitely do so, and I'll be covering benchmarks later for both options. Moving on to the motherboard that I'll be using in today's build, I originally had planned to use this, which was Gigabyte's B550M DS3H, but upon closer inspection, I kind of forgot just how bare bones this particular board was. And for me, the thing that really put me off it was the lack of USB type C, which let's face it, is pretty necessary in the modern day and age. As such, I've gone ahead and picked up this instead, which is the ASRock B550M Pro 4. And you should be able to see we've got four RAM DIMMs on here, which is important. We've got a little heat sink for our M.2 drive, a bit of protective armoring over the PCI slot. And crucially on the rear IO, we've got ourselves a USB type C connection. Where is it? Just here. So we've got a fast USB-A and a slower USB-C, which is going to be really important. The thing this board doesn't have, by the looks of things, is a front panel USB-C. So we're going to need to figure that out with the case choice in today's build a little bit later. Before that, though, it's time to install the CPU. And if you've not seen these old Horizon CPUs, you're in for a bit of a surprise. And that is because when you take them out of the box, what you'll find is a CPU 
with pins on. Oh yes, this feels like a bit of a throwback. And what we need to do here is lift the arm on the socket up. So nothing kind of too massively dissimilar to what you might be used to. And then the pins on the chip drop into the CPU socket. So you do have to be careful because they can be quite fragile. The next step then is the memory. Now I'll be using the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots on this particular motherboard. So go ahead and just pull the clips back just as you would with DDR5. Grab your memory kit of choice. In my case, I've gone for this Corsair. It's basically their Vengeance RGB. They have a few different derivatives. Ultimately in the current market, whatever RGB sort of 3600 kit you can get your hands on is gonna be just fine. And then slide this in just as you would with DDR5. The notch is in a slightly different location, so it will feel a little different, but again, gonna be fine. And 32 gigs of DDR4 is still plenty quick enough for the build today. Following that, we've then got our M.2 SSD. That's gonna go into our M.2 slot just here. You are gonna need a teeny tiny screwdriver to uh, pull these screws out of this. I feel like I never have to say that anymore because all of the M.2 slots are tallest nowadays. However, we've got some manual labor today. So go ahead and just remove these screws. Slide in your SSD of choice. Now's a good time for me to explain. I've gone for the MP44L from Team Group. I think officially in terms of getting this on budget, I've budgeted for the 500 gig drive. But again, just look for 500 gig, one terabyte drives. You might already have a drive you can use. And if so, go for that. All about being a little bit creative. And in these more budget oriented builds, you do have more options than you would on a higher end system. So yeah, loads and loads of options to choose from. And once both of these screws are in, we should be good to go. Now there is one more component I'm going to deal with at this stage of the build and that's the CPU cooler. Now for the cooler in today's build I've gone for this. It's the up here, up one. I think I've also seen it described as the KC4 before. Ultimately this thing here is going to be absolutely perfect. You get support for all the AMD AM sockets, AM5, AM4, AM3 and even AM2. Wow. And this is going to do a great job of keeping the 5500 cool or even the 5600X if you choose to upgrade a little bit. You might be thinking is this cooler really necessary? You get the stock cooler with the build as standard. The stock cooler would be fine. I'm just not a big fan of them. I'm certainly not a big fan of the stock cooler. In my mind, a, a good system shouldn't be really, really noisy. It shouldn't have a CPU that runs, yes, maybe at a safe temperature, but still hot. And this for me is a much better approach. But if you really want to save the extra $20, you can go ahead and do so. A quick check of the manual shows basically what needs to happen. These four posts just need to go on with these two metal brackets and two retention screws. And they're going to go on each corner around our Ryzen 5 CPU. Once these brackets are in, that's then going to provide a nice base to install the CPU. CPU cooler on and that's really really easy you can just drop the cooler on a little something like so and then just tighten it up with the two screws one on the left and of course one on the right now the motherboard is all pretty much good to go and that means I can talk about the next component in today's build the case now buying a PC case is a bit of a, a bit of a minefield sometimes pricing can be really hard to compare as some cases give you loads of fans some don't give you any some cases feature really good build quality whereas some are quite poor and this which is Antec's new Flux M feels to me like a pretty good middle ground. It's got this nice mesh ventilation up front with two included 120mm ARGB fans behind, taking off the pretty large tempered glass side panel, which doesn't have too strong of a tint. And I personally like, you can see how easy that is to see through. And inside the case, you'll find a further three reverse blade, but non-RGB fans pre-installed at the bottom, and then a single ARGB 120mm in exhaust at the rear. Now, what this essentially means is you've got basically five intake and one exhaust fan, which is, in my mind, absolutely fine. A bit of positive pressure in here. And this case does lack some of the quality of life features like a side panel that holds when you unscrew it this one doesn't <laughs> but in exchange for a bit of a loss on some of those features you do save yourself quite a bit of money now it's got the front mounted PSU that we're seeing more and more common where it's kind of hidden behind these fans giving us really really good expansive GPU clearance and even comes with a, a small but I guess adequate integrated GPU support bracket I'm not 100% sure how much that's going to do but I don't actually think the card we've got today is going to be long enough to require it anyway now a quick glance inside the case and actually it's all set up perfectly for micro ATX motherboards. I'll point out the standoffs for you now. So you should have three at the top, three along the middle, and then two down the bottom. But the right hand one is lower than the left hand one. That means we're all good to slide the motherboard straight in. But wait, there is of course something we've got to do that we're not used to doing. And that is install the rear IO shield. Say what? Oh yeah. Now, if you take a look at the back of the case, you'll see a little IO cutout just here. We're gonna slide this IO shield in and apply some pressure to each corner until it clicks into place. Once the IO shield's in, I can then go ahead and install the motherboard. And I'm just gonna try and pull through these sort of loose slack on the CPU cooler cables at the same time. There we are. Now, Antec do include all the screws and stuff you need to install the motherboard. So go ahead and pop three at the top, three along the middle, and then as I say, two down the bottom at slightly different heights. Okay, it is coming together. 
together, slowly but surely. I'm pretty happy with that. Now I think what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna start trying to tidy up some of the cables and wiring and also deal with the front panel cables while everything's still easy to access. In this particular build, I've obviously not got any two and a half inch drives. So this little bracket here is gonna be, well, not really that necessary. I'm also gonna fish out all of these front panel cables, which I seem to still be missing one of them. Yes, and what I'm gonna do with these is get them run a bit more neatly and then try and get these wired up at the same time. I also wanna point out this bundle of cables here that comes included. Now inside of here are all of the fan and ARGB cables for the six included fans of which three are ARGB. And for this, you'll need to plug in one fan header to the motherboard and then one ARGB header as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in that fan and ARGB header to the bottom, then go ahead and plug in our front panel JFP1, our USB 3 type A, and HD audio. I need to figure out what I'm doing with USB-C shortly, as of course we don't have that natively on the front panel of this case. Good stuff. So two components left to go in the build. The first one I'm gonna do is probably the power supply, maybe the GPU. But you know what? I think the GPU is actually feasible next. We've done all the front panel cables, so it's actually not gonna get in the way of any of the power cables. Now this particular card was just the cheapest eight gig 9060 XT I could find. And it comes in from Sapphire. This is their eight gigabyte 9060. 60 XT. And if we open it up, you can see, yeah, look how cool that is. I like the black and the red. Got a single eight pin power cable, very efficient GPU, this one. And sits in a pretty nice form factor. You'd be surprised really just how much performance is on offer from the likes of the 9060 XT. The 5060, I'm kind of probably less of a fan of, but even that GPU is still gonna give you a surprising amount of frame rate at, you know, the likes of 1080p and a bit of 1440p too. I think it's easy when you're wrapped up in all the high-end hardware to not get excited by some of the cheaper, more affordable stuff, but it's arguably the most important hardware on the market. Now, sliding this in just to see where it kind of lands, and it looks to me like we'll be using the first and second slots on the actual rear of the case. So what I'm gonna do is spin it around so you can see it, remove this little cover first and foremost, and then take out our top two slots on our rear brackets. I'm then gonna go ahead and push the little clip back on our PCI slot, slide the graphics card into place, get it all lined up, and that is gonna be perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the same screws I used to remove the PCI lanes, fasten the GPU in, and as mentioned earlier, as I suspected, it's not actually long enough to need to use the integrated GPU support bracket anyway. One more screw at the top here, and then all that's left to do is to provide power to not only the GPU, but all the other components in the build. And that's where this comes in, MSI's A650BN. Now, under the hood, this is a pretty power efficient 650 watt power supply that's got everything we need at a really affordable price point. You can see here, we've got our 24 pin motherboard cable. We've got our standard dual six plus two pin GPU power. We've got SATA power if we need that. We've got a single eight pin CPU power cable, no PCI Gen 5 support. So if you've got a, you know, a 5070, for example, you're gonna have to use the dongle if you wanna stick with this power supply or you'll need to buy a native Gen 5 design instead. Now, this is quite unique in that the power supply actually installs up here at the top of the case. And I've just located where Antec have actually included included the screws for this build. They're above the case, this little hidden doorway at the top, which is kind of funky. So if you need any screws, that's where they were. Now, the challenge is gonna be getting the power supply in. I'm sure you can take panels off if you need to, but I don't know if we do actually need to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just run all of the power supply cables through that hole there, one by one. This this is taking some time. And then I'm gonna slide the PSU into place. In terms of installation, the best way to actually do this is to screw it in from the top. Before that, I just need to add in our little PSU extension cable. That is so we can actually run power from the back of the case up to the power supply itself. And then it's a simple case of actually screwing the power supply unit into place. I'm then gonna finish things off by plugging in the CPU power to the top left, motherboard power to the right hand side, and GPU power to, well, the graphics card. And then hopefully this build should power up. So let's find the power button down here. Oh yes, we have got power. The cooler is all lit up and spinning. That looks great. The memory looks good. The front and rear fans. We're just missing one fan at the bottom, which I think is because of the cable. Oh, pull that through. Yes, look at that. You can see fans at the bottom are spinning. That's gonna provide really great airflow for the GPU and good clearance under here. And I'm excited to check out performance because I think this thing could pleasantly surprise you.
So the build looks pretty good and as good as a build at this price point can look. But how does it actually stack up in the performance department? Well, today you won't be surprised to hear all of my benchmarking was at that 1080p resolution, but I tried to stick where I could to high settings across the board. For benchmarking, I picked up this Yama Blackhawk GB244 1HSU monitor. It comes in here in the UK for under £100 and has an IPS 1080p panel with the 144Hz refresh rate that we want at that 1080p resolution. The big question though, can this build actually satisfy the refresh rate of this monitor? Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers that we gathered. Now, I actually tested this system with both the 9060XT 8GB and the 16GB card. And I'm going to start off at 1080p first of all in Fortnite at competitive settings. The 8GB 9060XT, which would help to keep this build in budget, achieved an average frame rate of around 125 frames per second. That was with everything set to low, except the render distance, which was set to far. Move up to the 16GB 9060XT, XT, and frame rates actually get close to that magic 144 hertz number with an average of 143 fps. I also tested a little bit at 1440p just to really push this build and see what it could do. Starting off again with the 8GB 9060 XT and Arc Raiders at 1440p high and the average frame rate was just shy of 95 frames per second with 94.8 while the 16GB card actually didn't move the frame rate needle that much further with an average of 95.1. Call of Duty's Black Ops 7 at the zombies mode at 1440p high on the 8 gig 9060 XT achieved 88 frames per second on average, while stepping up to the 16 gig card gives around 8 or 9 more frames per second with 97. Cyberpunk 2077 is a good test and a tough test of any system. 1440p high here on the 8 gig card achieved an average of 77 frames per second, while the 16 gig card pulled in an average of 76. We actually saw here a drop between the 8 and 16 gig models. Finally, Marvel's Rivals again on the 8 gig 90 60 XT at first, achieved an average of 74 frames per second, or stepping up to the 16 gig card actually saw a slight degradation down to around 70. This is well within the margin of error, but shows if you are looking to keep this build on budget, losing some of the future proofing with the 8 gig versus the 16 gig card isn't necessarily a bad thing for performance in a lot of titles right now. The biggest problem for me with this build is that the DDR4 memory prices have creeped up so much since I filmed this video that the cost savings just don't represent that much of an appealing difference difference versus going for a DDR5 platform build with a much newer CPU much newer motherboard and much newer hardware in general. This is a system that I tried to design to kind of dodge around a bit of the memory crisis, but it's certainly a system that's still caught in the crossfire. I'll leave the parts linked for today's build down below. Of course, still a great system if you've got a DDR4 build already that you can move that memory across to without necessarily having the cost that DDR5 and a whole new memory kit might entail. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.